Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for a discussion on the critical mineral antimony hosted by Perpetua Resources. I'm Mackenzie Lyon, Vice President of External Affairs for Perpetua. Now, having grown up in Idaho and raising my family here now, I couldn't be more proud or excited by the opportunity presented by the Stibnite Gold Project and excited for our conversation today. I'd like to introduce to you our three speakers for today. Jessica Largent is our Vice President of Investor Relations and Finance. Our special guest, Christopher Ecclestone, is the Principal Mining Strategist at Helgarten & Co which he founded in 2003. And then Chris Dale is our exploration manager here at Perpetua. We will have a QA session at the end of this presentation and you can submit your questions by clicking on the QA box at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time. And we will get to as many of your questions as we can at the end of the presentation. And with that, Jessica, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks Mackenzie and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'll kick off with an overview of Perpetua Resources and then hand to Christopher to cover antimony market trends and then over to Chris Dale, who will share a bit on our project's history and future opportunity. Before jumping in, I wanted to highlight that yesterday we signed a collaboration agreement with US Antimony to explore the potential for processing our antimony concentrate at their processing facilities. As you will learn today, there are no mined sources of antimony in the US in the United States. Our project, along with U.S. Antimony's domestic processing capabilities, presents an opportunity to reestablish the American supply, supply chain of this critical mineral and commodity. Moving to slide two to point out our disclaimer. Why Perpetua Resources? Quite simply, our investment thesis has never been stronger. First and foremost, we plan to redevelop one of the largest, lowest cost and long life gold projects in the US. And given our low costs, the Stibnite Gold Project has great economics with a 15 year reserve life and a less than three year payback period. And we have a valuable byproduct in antimony, which means Perpetua could help reestablish primary production in the US and supply more than 35% of the country's demand. Our project is located in one of the best mining jurisdictions jurisdictions in the world, and we have strong community support. We are also well positioned to deliver environmental solutions and create value for all of our stakeholders. One of the many reasons we are so unique is that we get to solve long standing environmental issues through the funding and development of our world class asset. We will take an area abandoned after 100 years of mining, most of which was to support World War II and the Korean War and use a sustainable approach to restore the environment and develop a modern mining project. The Stibni project is one of the largest independent gold reserves in the US with 4.8 million ounces and it is the seventh largest reserve out of all US gold deposits. In total, we have 6 million ounces of measured and indicated resources with an additional 1.2 million ounces of inferred resources. This translates to annual gold production that will average approximately 300,000 ounces per year life of mine and more than 460,000 ounces per year in the first four years. This slide does not include our significant antimony endowment, which Chris will touch on later. The Stibnite project has a low strip ratio at approximately 2.5 to 1, and combined with the high grade nature of the deposit, as well as the antimony byproduct, we will be in the lowest quartile of the global cost curve. Life of mine all in sustaining costs will average less than $650 per ounce, and in the first four years, our costs will be less than $450 per ounce. All of these factors will allow the mine to generate strong free cash flows, averaging about $500 million per year over the 15 year life. And with gold near $1,800 per ounce, our margins will be very high, but most importantly, our project is resilient to lower gold prices given our solid position on this cost curve. With that overview, I'll now hand it over to Christopher from Halgarten to provide an overview of why antimony is critical. Thank you very much. 
um, welcome and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here about antimony, uh, one of the subjects on which I spent a long time talking, um, in which uh, many people do not know um, some of the fundamentals of this uh, metal. Now, this metal actually dates back to the times of the ancient Egyptians. Um, indeed, uh, the famous pictures of um, Cleopatra, etc., with the, the dark eyes, that dark eye makeup comes from antimony. Uh, but the name antimony comes from uh, the Greek word antimonos, means never found alone, uh, because it does tend to come with other metals um, in the mining process. And in this case, at the Stibnite mine, comes with gold and silver. Uh, another factoid about the metal is that its, uh, its chemical symbol is SB, which comes from the Latin word stibium. And from that, we have the word stibnite, which is the, me the mineral which originally was mined at the stibnite mine in Idaho. So it all ties back to, um, to this ancient usage of antimony. Um, now, if we could look to the next slide, uh, we can see here uh, the critical situation of antimony supply. Uh, now, a bit of history here is that, in fact, China has dominated the supply of antimony since at least the 1500s. So the 16th century, China discovered a mine, uh, which is still functioning today, called the Twinkling Star Mine, which has been since uh, around the 1850s, the world's largest antimony mine. It has been at times up to 40% of global antimony supply. But the dynamic here is that that mine after so many centuries of exploitation is now in decline. So we see a situation here um, with this pie chart where um, it looks like China only has 53% of the global supply. Uh, global production. Now, China, though, has um, as recently as 15 years ago, had more than 80% of the global production of antimony. What has happened is that overexploitation by the Chinese and low pricing for a long period drove out other competitors from the market. And China overexploited what was ultimately a finite resource. And so their share of the uh, the mine production has gone from over 80%, now down to 53% and falling rapidly. But this chart um, hides some other factors, which is that China is the world's largest processor of antimony still. So looking at this chart, you see China with 53% of the production. But in fact, all of the Burmese share, most of the Bolivian share, all of the Australian share, all of the Tajikistan share and half of the Russian share are all exported into China, where China roasts and smelts the antimony that they import and then goes out to the global market. So in fact, uh, China still dominates 80% of the world's processing of antimony. And that is what makes antimony exceptionally vulnerable to Chinese machinations. And that is one of the reasons why antimony has now been um, slated on the uh, US federal government's list of critical metals. The EU have it on uh, their list of critical metals. Uh, the Japanese do also, as do the British. Antimony is very much dominated at this point by the Chinese, and they can potentially squeeze the supply. Uh, so now we can have a look at the fact that the US really since um, the closure of the Stibnite mine many decades ago um, has had no domestic antimony production. It's been it's become entirely dependent upon this source of Chinese material. Now that may not um, uh, ring alarm bells and hasn't rung alarm bells until now but in fact because of its vital role in energy defense and technology applications is very vulnerable uh, to uh, Chinese um, price manipulation and potentially to having the supply of the metal um, cut off to the US market and to the US's allies around the world. We can go to the next slide. 
we can see that um, antimony is uh, vital to the energy sector. Uh, it's used in copper wiring insulation uh, because of its uh, ability to resist uh, it's, as a fire retardant. Uh, it's been used for uh, nearly 100 years now in lead asset batteries because antimony, when uh, alloyed with lead, um, uh, hardens the lead. Uh, it's used in solar panels, it's used in wind turbines, and it's also used in lighting um, factors. But if we go to the next page, we see the, um, the most exciting new application of antimony. So um, production of antimony and consumption around the world is around 170,000 tonnes a year. Uh, and the, that has remained stable for a few years now with only small annual increments of 1% or 2% in demand. But now we have the potential for a new technology to um, create a, a surge in demand for antimony, which cannot be met from the current supplies. Because as I noted before, um, Chinese supply is Chinese um, internal production is in decline. And many of these other countries have also not got um, uh, a strong investment history in antimony. So we've seen a situation where there has been no real increase in antimony supplies in the last decade. Part of that has been because of low prices. The low price situation is now history as antimony has soared in price over the last year and has effectively doubled in the last six months. Um, but if we look at the, the new application, uh, well, I use the word new application because mass storage devices using antimony molten salt uh, actually dates back to after the Second World War. But it's only really in the last 10 years when forces like Vinod Kosla and uh, Bill Gates have got behind the new technology, which was being developed by um, academics at Harvard and MIT. And they've come up with a company called Ambry, which is... Uh, and produce, it takes the antimony and in uh, liquid metal batteries, uh, it's able to produce um, a mass storage device that can compete with a vanadium redox flow batteries, which are currently the only other mass storage device with, um, which, with large applications. And the interesting thing here is that, uh, you know, people imagine that lithium ion batteries and uh, and certainly uh, Elon Musk would like you to believe that uh, they are the solution, not only for EVs, but also for mass storage. Uh, unfortunately, that is not the case. The problem for lithium ion batteries is that they lose uh, their energy charge very rapidly if they're in um, a very cold or very hot environments. And in the hot environments, they're also prone towards catching fire. Um, and we've, we've heard about these scares about lithium ion batteries spontaneously combusting. That is something that does not happen with lithium, with antimony in liquid metal batteries. Also, uh, you know, when you're talking about mass storage devices that will be employed in, um, with uh, solar farms and with wind turbines, uh, if they are located in cold environments, and we're talking about you know, the northern half of the US, and we're talking about Canada um, and uh, northern uh, climes in Europe, uh, the lithium ion batteries are just not suitable because in cold environments, they lose their charge very rapidly. So this is an exciting new technology, which is now starting to, it's been around for, um, in this um, uh, format for around 10 years, but it's now starting to get applications with, um, with uh, mass usage in solar farms including in Nevada and locations such as that. Then we also have antimony in the, uh, the uh, circuit board industry, um, semiconductors. And of course, semiconductors are now a hot topic because of the global shortage of these. Uh, but moreover, ant antimony has dominated the fire retardant and flame retardant industry for around the last 20 or 25 years. And that's been the big driver of antimony growth over those years. Uh, now we've got other technologies such as the circuit boards, um, such as the, uh, 
the solar panels and now the mass storage devices picking up the um, the baton and running forward as the new technology in the sector. Then, of course, we, we come to the, the critical uh, aspect that, of the reason why uh, the US government and others has added this to their uh, critical metal uh, list. And that is because of its many applications in the military and defense sectors. And so not only are, of course, the circuit boards um, used in the, uh, the defense sector, but specific applications such as these we see here um, are, are vital. Uh, you know, Antimony has, a, before the flame retardant um, uh, usage appeared uh, during the 1970s and 1980s, Antimony was mostly known actually for its munitions aspects. Um, since the late 19th century, um, it was realized that lead um, fortified by antimony as an alloy uh, made armor piercing um, bullets and shells. And such was the demand for these during the First World War when there was a massive spike in demand. And then during the Second World War, where the US uh, faced a, uh, a crisis because it didn't have sufficient antimony of its own and let that be a lesson here. And so it um, launched the um, development of the uh, Stibnite mine in Idaho. And so the golden days of that mine were during the Second World War when it provided the antimony and the tungsten for the US war effort after uh, supplies of antimony from China, ironically, were cut off by the Japanese invasion of China. So here on the next page, uh, we can see the world antimony reserves. Um, I would actually, uh, these numbers are from the USGS, um, but you know, the, the reserves in China are a mystery number. And I would suspect that they're actually lower than um, we are seeing here. Uh, and if you look at the production Global production, as I said, was 170,000 tons per annum. Uh, the whole Chinese supply would disappear in two years. Uh, I suspect that Chinese supplies of antimony are actually in severe retreat at this moment. And I think that they're rationing supply. And that is one of the reasons why we have seen uh, the massive price surge during um, late 2020 and the start of 2021. Uh, some of these other markets, uh, if you look at Bolivia, for instance, um, Bolivia, as we saw from the previous pie, is only providing a very short, small amount of the global production. And the US, of course, with 60,000 tonnes there, um, there is, and as we'll hear later, potential um, to increase, to actually be producing that, um, the amounts that the US needs, but also um, to expand the resources um, potentially in Idaho uh, from the Stibnite mine. So um, hopefully we'll see um, greater production from there. And as we can see the reserves in Tajikistan, which makes up um, around 20% of global production are actually quite small. So there is the potential for some of these smaller producers here to actually um, run out of supplies of antimony. So the potential is there for uh, further upside in the price of antimony as some of these um, these reserves are not replaced and uh, there is a squeeze on antimony supply as we're starting to see at the moment. And then on the next page, we can see what has happened in recent times. Uh, you know, there was a long period of quiescence, which actually goes back further, probably another two years before this, uh, where the price of antimony was down and out. And because it was down and out, no one was looking for new uh, supplies. Uh, no one was developing new mines. And uh, the potential is here for Perpetua to be the main listed exposure to antimony in Western capital markets because the Chinese uh, assets are mainly owned by um, companies listed in China or uh, the state-owned enterprises. Uh, Perpetua has the potential to become the main exposure to antimony in Western and particularly in US and Canadian equities markets. As we can see here, there was a massive upsurge in the price. Part of that was uh, due to uh, scarcity issues, but also uh, the realization 
that Ambry uh, and its molten salt technology, which for a long time had been on the, um, on the drawing board, was actually starting to become uh, a reality. And uh, that is really the outlook for antimony at the moment. It's one of Chinese domination. It's one of declining Chinese resources and production. Uh, and there's the exciting opportunity to actually rebalance antimony supplies away from China and break their stranglehold on the metal. And Perpetua has um, a key role in doing this and liberating the US from and its economy and its defense sector from a China dependency. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Christopher. Uh, that, was, that was a great uh, review of the, the markets. Um, thank everybody for joining us. Uh, uh, after Christopher's review of why animo needs a critical material and, and where it's used uh, and how supply chains work, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about how our project might uh, be part of the solution. <clears throat> Historically, uh, stibnite, uh, as Christopher mentioned, uh, it's named after the mineral stibnite, uh, antimony sulfide. Uh, the district has spanned uh, activity uh, starting uh, literally a century ago. Uh, there's been a lot of activity, uh, particularly uh, right before World War II and during World War II, the district essentially exploded, uh, if you excuse the pun, uh, when it became the primary producer of antimony uh, and tungsten for the US. Uh, during that period, uh, the mine produced over 90% of the antimony and 40 to 50% of the tungsten for the US war effort. Uh, that expansion occurred very rapidly, almost exponentially, uh, and it did come at a cost of the environment. Um, the sites had many firsts, and some of those firsts include uh, the birthplace of antimony flotation methods. It was well known to the president and to the War Department uh, as this quote indicates, uh, it was very significant uh, in terms of, of its impacts uh, for the war effort, where this quote uh, by a, a military uh, supply uh, general noted that it saved potentially a million American lives and cut the war off by a year. That's not an insignificant feature or fact. I guess one of the things that's important here is that this site was, was managed uh, to some extent by the US government and it was considered a strategic site, uh, something uh, on the account of the Manhattan Project. Because so this wasn't your typical mine uh, by any stretch of the imagination. As Jess noted, uh, we have a significant gold reserve uh, contained within a larger uh, mineral resource, uh, but we also have significant animony resources and reserves. Uh, the green colors here are the the antimony in thousands of pounds uh, of reserves and resources. And you can see that there's considerable uh, amount of resource uh, that has not been converted into reserves, for instance, at Hangar Flats. Um, so what do we do with this stuff? How do we, how do we process it? Uh, it's a fairly standard uh, flow sheet. We basically uh, crush, uh, grind, and float the sulfides. Uh, initially, we suppress the pyrite and float the stibnite at a coarser grind. So we end up with an antimony concentrate that's cleaned and then shipped off site for processing elsewhere. The pyrite concentrate is, is then, uh, the pyrite's reactivated and then floated, uh, sent through a pressure oxidation facility uh, and, and basically uh, leached into gold. So what do, we, what do we do with the concentrate? Um, there's lots of different approaches to handling antimony sulfide uh, stibnite concentrates. Uh, there's conventional pyrometallurgical methods of smelting and roasting. Uh, there's hydrometallurgical approaches using solvent extraction. And we've done quite a bit of test work uh, to look at the opportunities uh, and, and our ores uh, and materials uh, produce a very clean antimony concentrate that's low in impurities uh, and will demand a, a premium in the market because of their higher grades and low impurity levels which are important for many of these high technology and energy applications. As Jess mentioned, uh, the project here would supply a significant amount of US demand for antimony, uh, about 35% uh, over the first six years of the mine life and about 20% over the life of mine. Um, and, and that's a pretty important number uh, and, and that's not counting uh, 
potentially the the value that might occur if we discover and be able to develop additional resources. So let's talk a little bit about the expiration upside. Uh, it is a historic district. There's been a lot of work. Uh, the image on the right is a map uh, showing the district uh, roughly uh, centered. Uh, the stars are the three known deposits with past production of antimony from the Yellow Pine deposit on the northern uh, upper left area and the lower left uh, at the Meadow Creek mine at the Hanger Flask deposit. Both of these uh, exploited mineralization that was hosted in intrusive rocks as an example of, of that style of mineralization is shown in the lower left photo. Uh, and the style of mineralization includes uh, breaches and stockwork veins and disseminated styles of mineralization that facilitated bulk mining of what traditionally would be considered lower grades of antimony. Uh, and, and, but they perfected the methods here. Uh, if you notice in that image to the right, though, there seems to be a, a bit of a bullseye type effect, and that's reflecting uh, potential mineralization that may be hosted in sedimentary rocks that have not had significant expiration. Uh, as an example of that style of mineralization uh, in the, the lower right photo is a breccia composed of stibnite, the antimony sulfide mineral cementing carbonate rock. Uh, this style of mineralization is more typical of some of the deposits in Mexico, uh, Bolivia, and China that are some of the world's largest antimony deposits. So we, we think there's some potential there, uh, but we have to conduct additional exploration uh, to get there. This is an example of the, the hangar flask deposit. This is a long section uh, looking at mineralization. In this case, this is gold mineralization with the purples and reds being higher grades. Uh, and you can see on the upper left, there is a black dashed line. Uh, that is a reserve pit. And underneath that, you see another dashed line, the red dashed line, that is our resource pit. You can see there's a significant amount of mineralization between the reserve pit and the resource pit. And so that's one of the opportunities here. The black dots throughout the image are areas of antimony mineralization greater than one tenth of a percent antimony. And they're quite significant. And so mineralization not only exists between the two uh, pit boundaries or model pit boundaries, but also beneath the pit. And we've drilled antimony mineralization uh, several hundreds of meters down below the resource pit. Uh, whether or not these resources can be developed uh, uh, depends on additional drilling, engineering studies, metallurgical work, uh, and potentially additional permitting if additional resources were to be identified. Another example of mineralization includes uh, what we call the scout deposit. Uh, scout was actually a, a discovery made by the, the government workers here working on the strategic minerals programs in the 1950s looking for antimony in tungsten. Uh, they actually discovered a, a, a number of antimony occurrences that were buried underneath glacial material and not exposed at the surface. In the 70s and 90s, the site was explored as a gold prospect with a number of operators drilling a series of holes. And in 2010 and 11, uh, Midas uh, predecessor to Perpetua uh, examined much of this area and we recognized the similarities of mineralization here to what had been exploited at the Meadow Creek mine. And we poked a number of holes here and, and discovered a number of high grade antimony zones that potentially could be uh, uh, exploitable by underground mining methods. We don't know that that's a, a, a certainty yet. And so part of our proposed activity and our plan of operations with the US Forest Service was to develop a exploration decline here to be able to get in and efficiently test and drill this area because the topography uh, makes it difficult to drill this from the surface in a manner that is appropriate for testing underground potential. This particular system is open a long strike and down dip in both directions, so it's, it's highly encouraging. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, as, as Christopher noted, uh, many countries have recognized the importance of antimony uh, and other critical minerals, obviously, to their well-being from a national defense, uh, economic, and uh, manufacturing stability standpoint. And the U.S. is no different. Uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, a bipartisan uh, group was formed in the House of Representatives, uh, and one of those was uh, a representative from California, uh, Eric Swalwell, this quote is his, uh, but it points out the importance uh, and, and the significance that the government has placed 
along with a number of executive orders and secretarial orders to help develop mines to feed the supply chains uh, in, the, in the downstream end. Uh, that's all I've got over to you, uh, Jess. Thanks, Chris. So just wrapping up with a few slides on where we are as a company. Over the last decade, we have been diligently and thoughtfully advancing study work and progressing through the permitting process while continually improving and refining our project. In August of last year, the US Forest Service released their draft environmental impact statement with a 75 day comment period. There were 10,000 letters received and about 85% of the letters were positive. Today, the Forest Service is reviewing the comments, refining and improving the project before they present a final EIS and a draft record of decision, which we expect by the end of the third quarter of this year. I would also just highlight that we were approved to list on the NASDAQ earlier this year and have now been trading on the exchange since mid-February. Our liquidity is more than doubled and we expect this milestone to continue paying dividends well into the future by giving us greater access to capital. And we could also see significant demand for our shares as we become eligible for index inclusion. Our project's free cash flow profile demonstrates exceptional values at different gold prices. Using our base $1,600 gold price, the project has an MPV of greater than $1.3 billion using a 5% discount rate and also delivers an internal rate of return of more than 22%. We have really good leverage to higher gold prices as well, where the MPV increases to approximately $1.9 billion at 1850 gold. But as I mentioned earlier, our project is resilient to lower gold prices given our solid position on the cost curve. Based on our current market cap, we are trading at nearly the widest discount to net asset value, despite achieving significant milestones in the last six months. At our current prices, our stock is trading at less than 20% of our net asset value, and we believe this represents a very attractive entry price for new investors. Despite all of our recent achievements and near-term catalysts, we continue to be significantly undervalued relative to our peer group with nearly all of the pre-permitted projects trading at a multiple of two to three times where we're trading today. And some fully permitted companies trade at significant premiums to their net asset value. It's also worth noting that these projects are gold only and our project has the valuable byproduct, which you just learned about, which again would support trading at a premium to our peer group. We do expect a significant re-rating to occur as we advance through the permitting process, but we also believe there's room to grow today as we begin to share our investment thesis with a broader investor group who recognize the strategic value of our asset for its antimony, as well as thematic investors looking for companies that are going to make a true difference environmentally. So in summary, Perpetual Resources is unique because we bring solutions. We have a large, low cost and high grade open pit gold mine. We will offer the only domestic mined source of the critical mineral antimony, and we will use mine development to fund restoration at an abandoned mine site. So with that, I'll hand over to Mackenzie to moderate the Q&A. Well, Chris and Christopher and Jessica, thank you so much for your presentation today. A lot of really good, helpful information. Chris, the first question goes over to you. The question we got was with the recent um, deal that we have penned with US Antimony, could you speak more to that specifically and their potential processing capacity? Uh, sure. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we're examining all the options we might have uh, for processing the antimony concentrates. Uh, and right now, uh, U.S. Antimony is the only uh, American-based company uh, processing antimony concentrates. So we wanted to study, uh, want to study the viability of entering into a long-term partnership with them to be able to find a, a way to secure a, a processing of the antimony concentrates. So the agreement outlines the plan for us to send some samples of our concentrates to their facilities. Uh, and, and see if they can process the material and whether or not uh, uh, there's some synergies there. Uh, it does establish a potential opportunity to reestablish a North American supply chain for the, for the material that hasn't existed for decades and decades. Great, thank you, Chris. 
Christopher, the next question is for you. Could you describe a little bit more the potential impact the AMBRI high capacity battery might have on the overall antimony market? Yeah, happy to. Um, AMBRI actually published a rather interesting statistic, which is they said that for every gigawatt hour of mass storage utilizing their batteries, that would require 1% of the global current supply of antimony. So that would mean um, with 170,000 um, tons per annum of, of antimony being consumed that every gigawatt hour of capacity installed would require 1,700 tons of antimony at, uh, at 11,000 a ton, which is roughly where are the prices at the moment for antimony trioxide. Um, we can see that that would be a big um, kicker in terms of um, not only uh, take up of, uh, of antimony from an entirely new um, demand source, but it would also um, mean uh, that, uh, you know, the, the amount that would be being spent on extra antimony would be um, sizable. So um, it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, it's pretty exciting. Great, thank you. And the next question, Christopher, I'll, I'll keep it with you for a moment. Can you speak a little bit more to the dynamics of how China operates in the market? Yeah, well, that's very interesting because you may have seen there um, that there's some estimates of uh, in, in those charts of Vietnam. Now, for a long time, um, it's been thought that Vietnam doesn't have anything vaguely like that amount of antimony reserves. Because what happens is that the Chinese, um, as, as we know in many metals, uh, particularly rare earths, have this policy of, of putting on VAT, uh, that value added taxes, taking it off, having export controls, taking them off, export licenses, uh, import licenses. And so um, it's felt that, uh, that Vietnam is used as a bit of a washing machine uh, for um, putting antimony out into the global market that is not um, paying the taxes in China and not sticking to the export license. Even more negative though, is the situation in Burma, Myanmar, where as we know for the last few months, there's been, uh, there's been a coup and uh, that's created massive um, sort of civil disruption, but also export and import disruption. Now for a long time, the Chinese have been felt <coughs> to be um, taking antimony from artisanal miners in the north of Burma and taking it across into China without going through the ports and without going through the customs in Burma. So the Burmese government is not collecting the taxes on these uh, products because it's essentially being smuggled into China. Even worse is that, um, as people may know from Dodds-Frank and that, that act that was passed uh, over 10 years ago now, um, you know, a lot of products out of uh, the DRC, uh, the, the Congo, were described as being conflict minerals. In fact, the antimony that comes out of Burma could also be described as conflict, a conflict mineral because while it's being mined by artisanal miners, it's actually um, under the control of rebel armies in the north of uh, Burma and is actually being used to trade with China to buy guns for these rebel armies struggle against the central administration in uh, Rangoon. So um, we have there a situation, there's a lot of illegality around about uh, artisanal mining all around the world, whether it's from sources where China picks it up in uh, Laos, uh, Honduras, Bolivia, um, or as we've said from, from Burma and smuggles it into China and then passes it off once it's been roasted and processed in China as a Chinese uh, product. And in fact, it's coming from pretty nefarious and dubious sources. Thank you, Christopher. And kind of on that, we had another question asking what alternatives there might be for the renewable industry in the United States should we lose access to that Chinese market? Um, it would be pretty disastrous. Um, particularly, you know, we have a gap now 
uh, in the period between now, when the Chinese supply is, is, is pretty damaged and in quite a, a steep decline, and the period when perpetual work actually comes into uh, production. Um, so the sooner perpetual work gets into production, um, the better it will be for um, guaranteeing that the US doesn't um, see damage to its supply of antimony. Um, there is actually a, a chart, uh, we haven't shown it here today, but it's in the, uh, for people who want to go to the perpetual website and look at the, the conventional presentation there, that shows that um, uh, Perpetual will be making up a decent proportion of the uh, US demand for antimony, and so it will be helping to uh, plug that gap once it's in production. Great, thank you. And just to be careful of everyone's time, I'll have one more question and we'll try to squeeze in here. Uh, Jess, this one's for you. How would you describe the gross revenue balance between the gold and antimony within the Stibnite Gold Project? Thanks, Mackenzie. Um, there's no doubt the economics of our project are driven um, by the gold revenues. Um, so I think antimony, when you look at our base case of $1,600 per ounce gold and $350 a pound antimony, it's about 5% of the overall revenues life of mine. But the important stat is the one that Christopher just mentioned, and that's that our antimony could supply 35% of the US um, annual demand in our first six years of production. So that's really the key. But in terms of you know, the top line, it's small, um, but certainly we can supply a big chunk of US demand. Great. And Chris, I'm actually gonna give you the last question. Has the United States Department of Defense done anything to try to secure the supply of antimony that we're aware of? Oh, yes, they have. Uh, uh, I mean, there's some interesting facts related to that question. Uh, up until 2018, for over a decade, the U.S. government was buying ammunition primer material from China uh, for over a decade, our sole supplier. Uh, in 2018 and 19, they opened up the Defense Logistics Agency national stockpile and started purchasing antimony placed into the stockpile for emergency purposes. Uh, so they have taken some initiatives in that uh, respect, including uh, issuing grants, uh, one in case to uh, U.S. Antimony to try to develop uh, a processing facility uh, to meet the military specifications for those materials. Excellent. Well, and with that, everyone, first of all, I want to thank you for attending our presentation today. And secondly, if we didn't get to your question, First of all, just note that we will be sending around a follow-up email. Please feel free uh, to respond to us and we'll get back to you directly. Or you can also attend any of our other webinars uh, that we host quite regularly, um, whether they are on the project or our restoration of the site. Um, we try to offer these very, very frequently to make sure that we are getting information in front of people and answering your questions. So with that, Thank you again for attending and we hope to hear from you soon.